Hello, everyone, and welcome to the talk uh, from Martin Ede and, and myself. I'm not 100% sure if you can see us currently, but I already started with the sharing the presentation. Um, Martin and I are working at Bonfish for about uh, 15 years already. Um, and uh, our talk is about a fine balance. Um, the Bonfish map creation departments speaking on how they get from nothing to something playable in World of Tanks, basically. Um, for a short introduction, what is Bongfish? Um, we developed games uh, in the heart of Graz. Um, basically, we, uh, Bongfish was founded in two, 2017. Um, we released uh, about 11 titles on multiple platforms. Currently, we are about um, 50 employees from about 16 nations. And our latest achievements are that we have a trusted partnership with Wargaming. So this means that we have a distributed development uh, agreement with World of Tanks and several prototypes that um, is, uh, are done for Wargaming themselves. Um, we do have uh, co-developed um, on Microsoft uh, flight simulator. Basically, there was world reconstruction based on uh, Bing map textures with a self-developed AI. And there uh, um, is another department here that is um, working on this, or has been working on this Mars Village on mobile platforms. After Bonkfish got the um, um, the IP from, uh, from um, they. Uh, unified the Android and iOS builds and achieved a 99% uh, bug-free experience across all supported devices. Um, Bonfish has been uh, certified as a great place to work in 2020. And if you're interested, um, there uh, you can visit either our homepage or also our human resource manager, Bernhard, is hanging out in Discord and Garda Town. Um, so he will be... Happy to see you. Um, so generally, what is the talk uh, really about? Um, we give you a brief insight on which challenges uh, level design and level artists face on a um, day-to-day basis. Um, basically, how we can make our e um, lives easier. And um, as we are two different disciplines with one vision, uh, basically create the best playground for, for you players or for the players generally. Um, how we split up and how we uh, collaborate to, to finalize a map. On World of Tanks itself, um, what is World of Tanks? Uh, it's a game that deals basically with vehicular combat, uh, roughly in the time frame of the Second World War. Uh, it um, has uh, five tank classes, the heavy, medium, light, uh, and tank destroyers and SPGs. They have all different specifics and how they can um, or how they are played in the, on the battlefield. Um, and the game itself uh, has basic, basically simple mechanics, which can create quite complex situations um, when there are 15 versus 15 players. So basically, one of the core mechanics is the visibility system um, that consists of um, uh, um, you see everyone inside the, the near um, or close proximity to your tank. You have a spotting range, that's the green circle that is different to each tank, um, uh, where you can spot enemies. And then you have a render range within uh, other tanks are rendered. And um, of course, camouflage, so how um, the, the different foliage is covering your tank and this influences this, the visibility system and the spotting. And the other great um, pillar of the, uh, um, of the gameplay are, is the armor and shell um, gameplay. Uh, armor of the tank versus the shell that tries to penetrate and destroy the tank. And this, these are the two major gameplay mechanics that you should know about um, world, um, uh, in, in World of Tanks. So um, what we are going to talk about is a task we got for um, for a, a game mod we, we were making, basically, um, just to give you a rough outline, uh, we started on creating a new game mode for World of Tanks, which was called Grand Battle. Um, we already have developed two maps for this. Um, the Grand Battle map itself, or Grand Battle game mode itself, is increasing the player numbers from 15 versus 15 to 30 versus 30. 
And to keep the uh, playability somehow in place, uh, we also had to increase the, the map size, of course. Otherwise, it would just be a clusterfuck of tanks uh, running into each other. This also means more work, basically, because you have to fill more space. Um, we have been um, knees deep in initial paper scheming and edis editor sketching phase for the third map, um, which um, we should have uh, developed for that game mode. Uh, it should have been a desert game, uh, a desert map, but um, so to cover all the three different combo types of, of tanks. But um, it wouldn't be uh, game development if things turn out a little bit different than we planned. Um, so we got a request from the vision holders of World of Tanks themselves. Um, hello, we would need a map, a big map, for a specific event that should happen around uh, the times of the Battle of Kursk Oper Operation Citadel um, on a big map. So basically, one by uh, one point eight by one point eight kilometers, Battle of Kursk, uh, and the requirements from game design should be uh, that it's a grand battle map, thirty versus thirty, and it should be the third map. So basically, we scrap everything we had already for the uh, third map we initially planned, uh, and started anew. We got some additional info from them. Um, it does not need to be uh, historically accurate. Uh, which for um, Wargaming yourself on World of Tanks uh, specifically, if you talk about historic accuracy, um, they really look at buildings that the brick color should be like the, the house that was standing there or the, 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 the plan of the village needs to be like it was in 1944. Thank God it was just for us, uh, um, it does not need to be historically accurate, but people from the area, from the Kursk area, should recognize the, uh, it to be somewhere in their region. And, of course, uh, a deadline was given to us. Uh, it should have um, been, or it should be released at the uh, anniversary of the Battle of Kursk, the Operation Citadel. And, yeah. Um, Let's put it like that. That was kind of a, a tight time frame, and uh, the time budget was not right. As we received the um, the, the request on the nineteenth of December, um, basically um, at the day before we started into our two weeks Christmas holiday. So, um, as the Battle of Kursk was in uh, late June, early July. Um, that was our Christmas pres present um, for starting next year with it. Um, yeah, so for level design, uh, every map um, does start with research on, on the actual product, what you're going to do. Um, we research uh, about the histi historic uh, background of the, the area, so the um, the... Operation Citadel um, was basically uh, uh, the, the Germans invading uh, Russia and the south, southern, southern side of uh, the Operation Citadel was uh, already covered quite, uh, quite good by uh, um, Wargaming yourselves. So we decided, uh, or we were looking about the northern side of the, um, of the, the uh, the uh, Operation Citadel and found uh, a, a battlefield that um, that suited our needs. Basically, it was not dealt yet with yet in the in World of Tanks itself, and um, yeah, so we kind of liked the area, but there was not that much uh, information about the surroundings there. So what we have done was we looked at um, the location, how it was looking back then and how it is looking now. Um, basically, the landscape features are um, not that great. It is basically a flat surface uh, with some little soft uh, crests and er uh, erosion lines around it. Um, the building structures were loose houses uh, standing uh, around. But um, because it does not, didn't give us quite a lot to work with, um, we also investigated the infrastructures uh, nowadays. 
And uh, there we found out, okay, there is at least a, a, a train running through the modern city as it's developed, give us some more insight on how um, the, the actual place could look like. Um, this is the first point where level design and level art um, are coming together, basically forming a setting description where we uh, brainstorm about the, the general area, um, what is what gives us strong and diverse landmarks, how we could um, develop the diverse uh, biomes, what we can use, how can we alter the given uh, aspects that are here, move uh, other stuff from the surroundings closer uh, into the playable area and stuff like that. Also, um, when this is done, uh, setting up it as a toolbox so that we uh, basically um, can start work working. Um, we start with the paper scheme. That's basically for us to create the macro gameplay, um, the basic routing and how we can integrate the different uh, terrain formations we would like to use, like the, the gullies and the, the heights uh, and, and ridges. Um, then basically work on tank distribution, how the different tank types are going to dispute themselves into the, the map and where the advantages and disadvantages positions of the, uh, the different tank types could be basically working out where spotting clashing zones, how the advancing routes will work out and stuff like that. Um, also, the initial player guidance um, is integrated already into those sketches um, where we talk about how the landmarks are placed, which biomes are, are we using for, for which area, um, how are the routes and the, the visual blockers set up and stuff like that. Um, after this is initially done, we switch to the editor sketch um, where we translate the, uh, this sketch or this, this paper scheme into, uh, into our first black block out in uh, 3D. It's just roughly um, a quick Terran block out. You can't really tell that much yet um, how the, the map is going to look like. Um, besides, these are some ridges. Um, but um, we quickly exchanged uh, the grey blocks and the, the just the terrain also with uh, real assets from the game to judge sizes and densities better. Um, of course, we're also setting up uh, the game mode and the tech pass for it and um, then start iterating on, uh, on it and refine the paper scheme and the editor sketch uh, till we are going to get to the playable prototype. The playable prototype um, is um, is when the, the editor sketch transform into something playable with other humans. Uh, so all the intended macro gameplay is in place and also the micro gameplay is uh, integrated. Basically, micro gameplay um, is from the grand scheme on how the different tanks are, are move in, in the whole uh, world into moment-to-moment -moment gameplay for how the how uh, specific tanks could use this to advance further, how they are going to spot in this certain location and stuff like that. Um, also, um, we are checking, as we are, have been iterating uh, quite a lot uh, to this point, if the mar landmarks are still uh, visible, the intent that routing is emphasized, like um, emphasizing roads and routes, um, so that the, the players are just able to um, identify them and basically uh, use the visual lingo that is established in World of Tanks to uh, mark certain areas. Uh, write a technical specifications document, so basically documenting all what you have done and um, articulate why you have uh, done this and then put it to a playtest. I can strongly recommend to do playtests with humans at all skill levels um, because um, bots usually do what you tell them to do and humans will just abuse the shit out of your minor design flaws. Uh, so you will recognize what you really need to, um, to, to, to fix and what you actually need to um, work on if humans play and yeah, so test with humans. It's it's really way, way better than bots. Um, also, it is good as a designer to um, to take part in the playtest itself. Um, 
at least observe what's going on or really take part while playing um, and get right into the, the things when uh, to, to see it. Um, be objective during those play tests and very important, don't play, blame the players not doing what you want them to do, but um, rec um, yeah, tell yourself, okay, um, my design led them to do this and not uh, they are not following what I thought um, they, they should do. And don't interfere with uh, the outcome of the playtest by leading, trying to lead them to do what you want them to do, because this is not what a playtest is for. Um, yeah, we, are, we have been fortunate enough to actually um, record all the playtests um, in... Um, uh, and for analytics, basically, so we got not only heat maps, but um, they are super helpful in the first place. Um, but what we could do in our um, in our tool, what we had there was to really uh, nail down um, damage, how much damage has been done at this certain location from where, and see really how the um, the players used certain areas of the map and read into it if the, it was what, how we intended it to, to be. So this was really helpful. And I think also for, uh, Level Art was quite happy to get those heat maps uh, to, to, to see uh, where they should focus on, basically. But Martin will be talking a bit more about this, I think. Um, yeah, and integrate the feedback you get or ask for feedback to get feedback and then react on that feedback uh, read between the light lines of what uh, players give to you judge what the actual cause of their problem is uh, and uh, build upon the strengths of a map basically what you should do then is plan uh, on what you want to, to change and what you expect from those changes and discuss with art uh, also what they still need to be implemented in the map to, to fully function in, also for them to, to um, uh, um, yeah, play around with this. Um, yeah, clarification early on makes it easier on the, on the long run. And yeah, the final iteration should be cleaned up and uh, handed over to level art. It's now Martin's turn. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Um, just a second, I'm trying to share the right screen. Um, all right, uh, can you see the presentation? <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, okay, um, so yeah, after Thomas uh, and his team is finished with the level design. So this is basically the point uh, the art team is taking over the map. So as he already mentioned, uh, we are involved already in the, the earlier stages when level design is starting with the map, with uh, research and uh, basically when we got the project assigned and uh, basically uh, having like the the main vision from the stakeholders, what we should do, where it should play, etc. Um, <clears throat> but due to the fact that we usually uh, work a bit uh, with an offset, as uh, yeah, the full art team is not able to to uh, work during the level design, is uh, doing the map prototype, and um, so we are not blocked. So we are usually, it is like this that uh, we are basically finishing a map. Um, with the whole production, polishing, QA phase, etc., And during this time, level design is creating a new map. So during this time, we have, um, of course, some um, consultation and we discuss all the things in the rough state or basically the, yeah, the, the general um, objective. But uh, the real work starts now for us. So what we are doing, uh, we taking all the things we discussed uh, before and what was planned and implemented already and creating now like a full art vision. The art vision is basically a presentation or a documentation of the whole map theme, um, which needs to get uh, pitched then to the art director and also needs to get approved then. So it should be like really a consistent, um, 
yeah, basically story and description of uh, the whole map, how it should look visually. And um, yeah, for this, we are collecting additional references, filtering out all those references, uh, creating artboards uh, of them. So really just choosing then uh, the final, really most consistent um, references we got, uh, could find for this location. So all is really uh, coming in together and, and fitting well together. Um, we are also creating mood boards also with uh, references and also creating concepts for the whole atmosphere, the mood and the lighting in the map. And also for all the locations, the biomes, and especially the big picture of the map, uh, we are creating um, concept arts, uh, paint overs, and also, yeah, a lot of references. So basically, um, what Level Design uh, did so far, they created um, yeah, basically the style of the gameplay area. But um, with the big picture and the outland, we need to embed this uh, gameplay area into like uh, a bigger environment. So uh, the player has the feeling of uh, being or, or playing in, in a, like an endless uh, vast environment, basically like an open world. But um, of course, he's limited to the map borders, but it should at least give the impression that um, he he is basically in a in a big landscape, um, and also for the landmarks. Uh, usually, level design is planning all the landmarks and orientation points already, but we are fleshing them out more to also adapt them to the to the visual um, uh, approach we want to go. Um, sometimes we uh, changing it a bit or or refining it. And also, uh, very often, we are implementing even more of them. So not just like um, having them for like the, the player and for the design as orientation points, but also like to have like visual uh, impacting um, hero objects, for example, which also give um, um, some character to the map design. And of course, also the narrative background need to be described. Um, so we get uh, the backstory, but everything should uh, play together. Also, as mentioned, with the whole architecture of the buildings, the asset sets uh, we're using, um, the whole uh, vegetation and uh, flora, the speed trees, everything should uh, look consistent and be basically out of this region as far as possible. So um, I'm just showing uh, a few examples. For example, here, these are like uh, some artboards, uh, what we chose for this map. Um, <clears throat> we're basically creating out of a selection of screenshots, which are uh, representing um, the, the specific biome um, as good as possible. So, for example, uh, here we had this uh, more dry area. Um, our idea was to split the map uh, a bit uh, into, yeah, basically a, a, a moist, a green, a flooded, um, yeah, more pleasant looking uh, area. And on the other hand, a more dried out, a bit more dangerous area. So, like from the concept that there is really um, a huge contrast in the map, in the feeling where the player is located. Um, so, he's also not just uh, orientated by some landmarks or some, some background effects, but also within the uh, biomes uh, itself. So, we are always trying to make it as... Uh, specific and is and individual as possible so these are for example the the flooded area which also gave us a good opportunity to extend this into the outland uh, by having like a huge uh, lake around and what we additionally implemented also is like a, a battlefield area also then extending into the outland with a really huge uh, burning forest uh, and um, yeah, some very intense uh, smoke uh, 
yeah, smokes and uh, smoke clouds. This is an example for the mood board. So in the mood board, we um, want to define how the atmosphere should look like. So basically, you can see some <coughs> different um, yeah, atmospheres, what we wanted to reach. So basically, a big contrast of uh, shadow and light. So we all also wanted to connect it with the, this with the uh, biomes itself to have like the whole uh, more pleasant looking area, the green area more lit up and like the, the dark area um, um, in like um, connected with a huge cloud shadow. So it's also was we also wanted to represent this in the lighting itself. Also, like the most important effects we have in this mood board, um, like this uh, huge uh, fire smokes. And um, yeah, also, for example, for the battlefield, that it should really look dangerous, like a devastated and destroyed place, which is uh, really unique then for the player when he is at this location. Um, after the art vision is finished and get uh, approved by the art director, we are heading into the next phase, uh, which is like uh, one also one of the most important phases. It's the sketching phase, and uh, in this phase, we basically uh, taking the map now in real and uh, trying to uh, transport all the vision, all the on paper ideas into the map itself. So everything just on, on a rough, uh, um, yeah, on a rough scale. So basically, it should just represent the whole idea on the map, uh, on the big picture, but not on the playable level. So in this phase, we can basically it's a proof of concept. So we can check if all the planned things are working out from playable perspective and not just on paper. So there, for example, we have this uh, kind of pillars like for the color map. It's a, a huge mega texture. We uh, usually blend over all the individual textures. And in this stage, we are using this texture just by uh, taking satellite data to really quickly draft out several biomes just to uh, quickly uh, be able to prove them without texturing the map at this stage already. Um, also, this phase is very important because um, in this phase, it's basically the last uh, chance to make like bigger changes together with level design. So if we see, okay, this uh, part of the landscape is not looking really credible or realistic enough for what we want to uh, uh, design it, um, we have now the chance to talk with level designers again is it possible to do there some bigger terrain changes because it always will affect the, the gameplay again. And usually we are discussing in this phase a lot and yeah, mostly finding compromises or solutions which uh, are serving the gameplay and the art. And yeah, of course, uh, in the end, always uh, gameplay rules, but uh, both parties are trying to uh, find the best solutions for everybody. Um, yeah, as told uh, already, the Outland and the Skybox was catching there. All the landmarks get gray blocked and put in the map to have like already the defined uh, shapes and in like uh, our advanced gray block in the map to really see how the gray block uh, works from all the perspectives if the shapes are clearly readable and not merging with other objects, for example. Um, the mood and lighting, just some rudimentary texturing, and also what is very important is some interesting views for the spawn points, as this is like the first impression the player gets when he uh, is uh, basically entering the, the game and needs to wait maybe for some other players until the game starts. So this is quite important that we're finding already some designs and ideas for these uh, spawn points. Uh, yeah, here you can just see, like, for example, some yeah, progressing of this color map. So in the beginning, on the first picture, we are just uh, putting in just really roughly images uh, from Google Earth, for example, or some other services as well. 
and then we are like evolving uh, to make it more and more consistent and this is like on the right side the uh, final consistent picture and um, yeah so it's a lot of work so this is all photoshop work it's uh, um, during the whole production also as it also has some uh, other purposes as well for the whole texturing pass uh, to sum it up, so in this phase, it's a strong collaboration with level design. So we have lots of discussions, arguments, and basically finding solutions for everything. It's a proof of concept, and it's also for identifying and highlighting risks at this phase. Because um, when we're entering the production stage, um, we should have all risks uh, eliminated. So for example, here we already need to think about, okay, if is this asset um, uh, set uh, working for us? Uh, does it take too much uh, texture memory or do we need different architectures uh, to represent the uh, credibility or the, the realism of this area and some other assets, some other buildings might have some different shapes and also then we need to align with level design if we can replace some houses with other houses if it works for everything. Um, <clears throat> After the sketch phase is done, okay, I need to hurry up a bit. Um, we are heading into the vertical slice. Um, it's uh, yeah, kind of a benchmark area. It also needs to be approved by the art director then. And there we do basically like on a small scale, on a small areas like a final pass, um, how the release state should look like. And if you're fine with everything and we see, okay, everything works out with all the content we chose, we are heading into the production. So production is basically doing everything. It should be quite uh, straightforward, um, transporting all the ideas from vertical slice and the, con the sketch phase into the release ready state of the map. And um, yeah, it's the longest phase, but it's the, usually the most straightforward phase. Then it's just like post polishing and optimization. It's the post-production. We polish certain areas and optimize uh, to yeah, reach the, the estimated budgets of texture and FPS. And uh, as Thomas already mentioned, we're also using the heat maps from the, the, the playtest data there to polish certain areas which uh, players uh, use most and it's very helpful for us as well. Um, yeah, so basically that's it already. I uh, just wanted to show a quick uh, a few seconds of a time-lapse video to be able to show how the map evolves from a really rough uh, sketch and from basically from the uh, level design prototype till the final stage. And while this video is finishing, I would like to thank you and uh, thanks for the attention. And of course, we are ready for um, some question and answers in the Discord channel. And yeah, hope is what hope it was interesting for you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. This has been so inspiring. Um, while we watch watch the video I, I just want to um quickly also announce um that there's a dedicated discord channel now called speaker q a um, um for for you both um if you have time it would be lovely um if you can join for a couple of questions and this was a really inspiring talk very fitting also um um, with the with the opening from Ivan, can we have a, like a large round of virtual applause, please? Thank you so much. And for me, the real applause, so inspiring and really great to see um, what you achieved with those techniques. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, um, then I um, would ask you to um, join the Discord Q and A, and we are um, back in a minute with our next speaker ready michael hartinger another postmortem